Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, one quick correction, and it's something that we should be celebrating. It is National Health Insurance Fund. Uh, and that was a major milestone in the transformation towards achievement of UHC or healthcare for all as per the big four agenda of His Excellency, the President, by this year, 2022. And I believe we are on the right track to achieve that. So first of all, um, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to this session today. And it's very apt. Actually, I've just walked in. And um, the reason I was a bit late is because uh, we were having a session in, in, uh, in Parliament, and we're all summoned. And the conversation was about a particular patient, and unfortunately, now deceased, who had been detained. Detained, first of all, while receiving treatment, and thereafter also detained for a prolonged period. Uh, the body was detained also for a prolonged period until it became a crisis and they had to have to intervene through parliament to have him released from the hospital. And that is a very sad story that is replicated in very many families, not only here, across the globe. And that is the reason why you find that now even SDG3 and many other SDGs that access to quality care, quality health care without suffering financial hardship is a priority of each and every government. I think even now in Kenya with our presidential hopefuls, um, it is one of the key agendas that they're talking about. And to set the stage, you see like this family that we had been summoned to try and find solutions, is a family of means. But unfortunately, it got to a point where even they, with means, were not able to support themselves at the facilities that they chose. Now, majority of Kenyans and what they earn, and many parts of the world, you cannot say that they have means. And is that a problem? No. Because when we seek healthcare, healthcare costs. You've seen all the sponsors outside there. They're selling state-of-the-art equipment, modern drugs, and all these costs, and somebody must pay. Healthcare being a very emotive subject, the issue of payment becomes ugly at some point. And we constantly need to remind ourselves that there's nothing for free. Somebody at some point must pay. So for us to be able to afford, there are only two options. Either we are rich enough to pay from pocket, or the risk is transferred. And how is the risk transferred? One of the obvious ways is the pilot that we were doing in 2018, which was an input-based financing model in the four counties where they were equipped with commodities, human resources taken care of, and that risk then was transferred to the government and of course financed through tax, et cetera. So that's one way, you transfer the risk to the government. And there are some countries that have been able to achieve that. The other way is to transfer the risk to somebody who can absorb that risk through pool financing or in other ways insurance or output financing models. And that has been demonstrated to be 
the more sustainable model. And why I've given that preamble is because now as a country and in our scale up towards UHC, we are going full throttle on an output-based financing model whose backbone is National Health Insurance Fund. The history of National Health Insurance Fund over the last 56 years has been driving towards this position. It has been a long journey, a lot of learnings, quite a number of mistakes, but I believe we are putting it together now. The reforms that are currently going on is the major step to ensure that we actually are able to get every Kenyan being able to access quality care without suffering financial hardship. And this reforms, and I'm sure will form the basis of what a lot of people will be talking about, the enablers to accessing quality care. I put them in four main groups. The first one, which we've made major strides on, is digitization. When you're looking at the whole population and being able to access and being able to track, being able to get information to make evidence-based decisions, digitization is key. Starting from the input level to the modes of identification, to the modes of reporting the treatment, to the modes of reimbursements and payment. And towards that end, as NHIF, what have we done to date? Right now, to access services is through biometric registration. And you recall, in, on 30th October 2020, His Excellency the President launched also the scale-up of biometric registration when we were starting the sponsorship of the one million indigents. Currently, to transact with NHIF, is on an electronic claims platform, an e-claim platform, to ensure we're able to do that. Other things are to ensure that our members are able to access services easily, so through self-care platforms. Actually, by a show of hands, for the Kenyans who are present, or members of NHIF, either statutory or voluntary, by a show of hands, how many have downloaded the app my NHIF? Or oh, how many even know about it? Oh. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five. Quite a number. That's great progress. So the self-care platforms, and we're looking at many more. So even in terms of the digitization, one of the key problems that we have actually right now, and we're talking to a lot of the telecommunication companies to see how we can overcome that, is that of our voluntary contributors, most of them, it's not that they don't want to pay. It's just that it's not convenient. They don't feel pressurized. They forget. So even automating that. So digitization is key. Secondly, was to create an enabling legislative environment. And I'm very happy after the president assented to the NHIF bill on 10th of February, no, 10th of January, we now have a platform to be able to actually achieve UHC in this country. And how will that be possible? For me, among the whole raft of new legislation is the fact that every Kenyan is obligated to pay. Every Kenyan is obligated to pay. And those who cannot pay to be identified and supported. And that is in the law. By that stroke, we'll be able to get every Kenyan at least to have the basic health care that they need without suffering financial hardship. 
and it still takes cognizance that there are those who can and there are those who can't. And what are we doing to be able to support those who can't? The third key element is the benefits. Um, in my past, actually, when I was in the private sector, we always used to say, the worst thing is to give free nothing. So we have continuously worked towards ensuring that the benefits that we are offering are meeting the great needs of our people. And this was stimulated heavily in 2015. And this was even following a directive by His Excellency the President when we started including packages for dialysis, um, mental health, etc. And now we have a whole raft of about 11 packages in addition to your usual in and out patient cover to ensure that the needs of the people are actually addressed. And finally, in terms of um, the four big buckets, is organizational transformation. The human resource that will support that. From the lens I wear is for a third party pair because we are an insurer. But also from, for many of the delegates here as well who are on the service provision is something that is very key. And we're very happy that um, a week or so ago the Kenya Medical and Dental Practitioners Council organized the first healthcare workers conference. And I see Dr. Kitulu here was there and it was first, I think in, in Africa or East Africa? Yeah. But as a fund over the time, we've grown from a very simple operation of reimbursing bed days spent to sophisticated insurance operation with different models of reimbursement. So all this is geared towards one thing, that we ensure we transfer the risk of healthcare expenditure from the individual because it's demonstrable that no one of us really can afford to carry that risk. If you're able, then your bells and whistles increase. But if not, we must have that environment. And how do we do that? There's no way government can be able to do it on its own. The interplay between private sector and public sector is very key. We know the challenges that we have. And I'll actually share a few of them. A lot of the trouble that you're seeing, we do have in the media, etc. For example, the benefit package that we are currently in negotiation with the private sector. At the onset, it was actually not intended to be for private sector. It was intended to be for public sector. But something interesting happened around 2017. We had the mother of all strikes, a 264 strike by healthcare workers in public sector. So the entire sector was almost collapsed. But as NHIF, we have received a contribution, a premium, and we have a promise to our members that they must access the services. So at that time, we engaged private sector. And that relationship, we've continued to nurture and grow because we've seen there is no way we can be able to do that without that. And the same thing has continued to happen. So the relationship now is being built. But the challenge and something that I would like to pose back is that as we work towards making sure for common good, where do we draw the balance between profit maximization and sustainability? And that's a question maybe uh, that should be discussed at some point. 
Secondly, in terms of how we work together and in keeping in the theme of this year's uh, symposium on women's health. You know, the women ladies are the backbone of the communities and this government has actually also worked very hard to ensure that happens. And one of the key and iconic programs, Linda Mama, for example, um, from when it was introduced in 2013, also under the tenure of our president, His Excellency the President, within a short time realized that it would be best run by a third party pair than that was NHIF, and it transitioned to NHIF in 2017. But leave those details. For me, what I celebrate is that from that time to date, 14.5 billion shillings has been spent. To me, those are not shillings or dollars. Those are women's lives that have been assisted to get access to supervised care. Every single year, we have about a million women in this country who register. And just to make sure it's non-discriminatory, you do not have to be an NHIF member. So in terms of commitment towards achieving UHC and to ensure that everyone has access, I'm very proud to say that there are so many models that we have and methods that we're using to ensure that we get there. And so many great examples. Year on year, the number of women who register increases. Um, in his speech on the 7th of February, His Excellency the President directed that we try and look at consolidating all the support that we've been giving, the government has been giving, towards different vulnerable groups. Because those who can't pay will pay. And those who can't pay need to be identified and supported. And these vulnerable groups, including the Linda Mama, because for Linda Mama to access that, you just need to be uh, in the country and register, not necessarily a member of NHIF. Programs like Health Insurance Subsidy Program for the orphaned and vulnerable children. Programs like uh, HISP for severely disabled and elderly is a demonstration that we've been on this journey for a long time. So I'm happy that the theme has caught on that UHC is not an event that we're going to switch on, but has been a journey. And I think with what we've been able to achieve, we can demonstrate that along the way. And with the support that the ministry is providing, I think it's something that we can celebrate. And truly speaking, with that political alignment and the partnerships that we have with the private sector, I believe we'll truly achieve His Excellency the President's Big Four Agenda this year. And that's a commitment that we have. So I think with those few remarks and uh, many moving parts, I would like to end there. And I thank you very much for your time and attention. Many thanks to Dr. Peter Camuño and moderator Kausal Shaw. It's an honor to be the first panelist amongst this august group of speakers. You will note that as Chemonics International's project director for a new USAID supported global technical assistance platform called Frontier Health Markets, I'm a bit of an odd duck or a black sheep on this panel of private sector uh, providers, including diagnostics, vaccines, insurance. But here's why it's great that I get to speak to you first. I'm going to try and convince you that it's not if or when, but how the private sector can best be positioned to advance women's health and well-being in Africa through UHC. And, when, and with that understanding of how, I'm hoping that you listen to the subsequent purely private sector speakers in a new way, listening for how they can be better positioned. But before I launch into that, I'd like to introduce this new program. Frontier Health Markets Engage is a global cooperative agreement funded by USA to provide technical assistance on health market development to leverage private sector in mixed health systems. 
led by Kimonix with results for development as co-technical lead alongside Pathfinder International Zenesis Technologies, FHM Engage will work through 16 local, regional and international network implementation partners to deliver la lasting results. Our mission is really to redefine technical assistance by engaging diverse actors from within health markets to discover new insights for old challenges and to co-develop systems approaches. We work through consumer-centered design, market facilitation, adaptive learning, and coaching to affect lasting change in the health system. Our value proposition really is to catalyze the adoption of fresh and contextually relevant pathways in health market development by building on existing structures and offering strong behavioral, technical, and managerial approaches. So now that you know a little bit about FHM Engage, back to my argument. So in gatherings such as these, as HBS, the private sector's importance in advancing women's health in Africa is really accepted as fact. What is up for debate and the real challenge faced by all of us is how the private sector's role can be catalyzed to help countries address the urgent health needs of women now. Within frontier health markets, we believe that the how is defined by addressing the market environment in which the private sector operates. The market environment levers are the public sector stewardship, market intelligence and information, institutional rules and regulations and norms, and financing. This market environment relies um, heavily influences both the supply of services, products, and information for women, as well as their demand. FHM engages the market addresses sorry the market environment by focusing on market facilitation. Market facilitation is a goal-oriented, systematic but flexible approach that promotes systems changes that go beyond the individual actor to affect many. Market facilitation is implemented by facilitators or change agents that intervene in markets to achieve health and health system objectives, but critically do not perform any of the function. So here's why FHM is okay being an odd duck or a black sheep on this panel. It's right where it should be as a facilitator. <laughs> These facilitators focus on building health uh, local ecosystems by coaching the market actors, including the public sector, private sector, communities, and development partners. The facilitators focus on defining local problems by addressing the root causes of underperformance or dysfunction. They support the co-design of local solutions to transform how governments, businesses, and communities work and think together. This coaching support um, this coaching approach supports the individual and system behavior change that's needed. We recognize that the market facilitation approach is different and challenging. The approach embraces the complexity and dynamism and really the unpredictability of health markets. The process involves actors who are not traditional counterparts and so have not had a voice in the discussions previously. And finally, the market facilitation process takes time that strains these market actors, both development partners and private sector. It strains their resources and their patients. But despite these challenges, the resulting behavior change in the market actors is worth it as it allows for greater reach and sustainability of the outcomes. And here we come to the second part of the how to which I referred. Chemonix and FHM Engages Consortium are not alone in prioritizing behavior change. The WHO has recently released their strategy report on engaging the private health service delivery sector through governance of mixed health systems. And this outlines six governance behaviors that are critical to ensuring the public and private sector work together for better health outcomes in UHC. These behaviors are building understanding, nurturing trust, fostering relations, enabling stakeholders, aligning structures, and delivering strategy. Over the next five years, FHM Engage will support the realization of these behaviors by public and private market actors alike. Chemonix and FHM see the opportunity to use market facilitation as an approach to support the positive behavior change that will improve market, the market environment, which will in turn improve the supply and demand for equitable access to integrated comprehensive care for women. 
So as you listen to the next five speakers talk about their contribution to UHC, make sure that you're listening for which of the six behaviors they're supporting and what aspects of market facilitation might help to unlock their contributions. Thanks very much. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Kihara. Dr. Kihara is a senior lecturer in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Nairobi. Since 2021, she's been the president of the Africa Federation of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. She was also a member of the FIGO Pregnancy and Non-Communicable Disease Committee. And she will be speaking on the private sector and vaccinations in maternal care. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to first and foremost appreciate the organizers for having us here. And I will actually ring on my topic from where Daktari has just left, Peter. Vaccination. We say prevention is better than cure. And I want to believe NHIF, can we move downstream in the sense every Kenyan should be prevented from illness, should have health promotion and make us jobless. We don't want to be in curative business, rehabilitative business. And vaccination really is the way to go. We've come from COVID. What were we doing? Trying to vaccinate as many people as possible. We have cancer, HPV. What are we trying to do? Prevent cervical cancer. So move to my next slide, please. But what's wrong? Why aren't we winning with women's health? Policy environment. In the newborn, we have the expanded program. What's in public and even advanced even further to private. But for maternal health, tetanus toxoid seems to be the only vaccine readily available. So there's the gap. Uninformed epidemiology of disease. Do we know how much of influenza is amongst our pregnant women? Do we know about meningitis amongst our pregnant women? We have knee-jerk movements. There's a problem, then we react. Locally, we have absent vaccine development. But good news is BioVax is here from December. So I have hope. Maternal vaccination schedules need to be addressed before, during, and after pregnancy. So we need to be very cognizant. What can you give a woman and when? And then vaccine hesitancy, which we all know about, particularly with the lessons learned from COVID. So much more, much, much more needs to be done with partnership and particularly private sector. Next slide. So I took an example, an example that is very close to my heart because it affects the mother and affects the baby. And I'll put it simply without going through too much medical jargon. A mother is blood group O negative as an example. So pay attention to the negative. The husband is O positive. So there's a 50% chance that baby will be negative, and there's a 50% chance that baby will be positive. And like the battery, the normal common battery you and I know, a positive and a negative do not agree. So the mother will mount up a reaction against a positive baby when she's negative. And warn to that little one. If the blood mixing happens too much while the baby is still in her, the mother will eat up the baby cells. Or the baby may be lucky to be born, but will turn yellow. And that yellow can even migrate to the brain and ultimately kill the little one. Or the baby will be maimed for life. Next, please. So look at this map. And I want you to pay particular attention. What is the gap when it comes to recess and prevention? The green, they are comfortable. The immunization's there. The red means over 80% do not access that vaccine. Where is Africa? I think it's painted red most. Next, please. Next. So looking at a bit more statistics. Next again. There. We have stillborns. That means the baby dies in utero. And you can have early neonatal deaths from this condition. We call it hemolytic disease of the fetus or the neonate. Sub-Saharan Africa is affected 11-fold. 
And I'll tell you why. 220,000 stillbirths, 40,000 neonatal deaths, and the brain contaminated with the jaundice in 30,000. That's long-term morbidity. Yet worldwide, look at advanced countries, 2.5 per 100,000. In sub-Saharan Africa, 385 per 100,000. We need to really wake up. Next. So what do I see as critical and urgent needs that we need to focus on? Women need to be brought into the clinics so that we can at least examine their blood group. That's the first step. And where she has blood group negative, find out the blood group of the partner. If it is positive, then you have to follow her as a high-risk pregnancy. Again, NHIF. I know you will put a service package and say a minimum package. What happens to the woman who must come in a little bit more often? We need to think about it right from now. If possible, and where there is access, and we're beginning to get those technologies, you can also check the baby while it's still in utero. Ultrasound can tell you the gross abnormalities when the blood has actually been eaten up by the maternal antibodies. But it is prudent, once the baby is born, to actually check the baby's blood group and where the mother has not reacted against her baby to get the immunization, both during antenatal and in the postnatal period. This is important. When you do vaccination programs, pay attention to the scheduling. Next. I won't go very far. I will just say we need guidance. We need a very robust NIH system. That is important. But above all, everybody in this room, I don't want you to leave knowing we just treat to cure or treat to rehabilitate or treat for palliation. The back stops with each one of you. Health promotion, prevention. That's the biggest gain this country can have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kihara, for painting a very serious picture on why UHC is important, not just for the mother, but for their baby that's not even been born yet. Thanks. So I'd now like to welcome Elena Contrera-Graf, Head of Public Private Business Development and Health Reinsurance for AXA. She has over 20 years of experience within the insurance and reinsurance industry. She'll be speaking on the insurer's point of view with regards to partnering with the public sector. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for organizing such a rare event where public uh, stakeholders and private players within the health ecosystem uh, brought together and to try to find the insights and to share experiences and knowledge in finding solutions to to deal with the challenges that the UHC um, are, are presenting. So um, protecting women's health is undeniably fundamental to, to the families and to the society. Such initiatives uh, can only have a um, powerful Im a societal impact if they are fully supported by the government and the institutions. And I'm happy to hear Dr. Kimono on, uh, and on their strong willingness and involvement. What does this mean? It means that beyond an appropriate legal framework, the healthcare financing, but as well as the efficient running of the systems are the key components of a functional healthcare system. Better women's access to healthcare spouts more generally how the public stakeholders are dealing with the challenges in implementing the universal health cover. Many governments have set ambitious targets towards improving health indicators by initiating UHC. Although health budgets are continuously increasing, resources, especially in emerging countries, remain scarce, requiring political priorities to be set up, especially in countries, once again, where fiscal space is limited. Is limited. Therefore, it's important to ask and to answer some questions. Who to be covered? How to be covered? Of course, having in mind the financial constraints and, um, and having in mind also the fact that our 
to which extent we have to prioritize some catastrophic expenses, which for the time being in Africa, they have completely financed out of the pocket. And we can mention here the cancer treatments, especially for women, but not only. Um, and once again, how to, finance this, how to finance all of this? Well, organized planning and implementation of uh, universal health coverage are crucial, and it requires a holistic view and expertise. Therefore, public-private partnerships can be highly beneficial. And once again, I'm happy to hear different panelists and as well Dr. Kevino talking about the win-win possibility to build a strong um, partnership. Um, and here, when I'm saying public-private partnership, all the players have a crucial role to play. From one side, the government and the institutions play a crucial role as a regulator, healthcare provider, and payer. From the other side, and I will speak more particularly regarding insurers that I'm presenting, um, they can definitely play a substantial role in helping governments to build and to run efficient and viable health systems. How? This is definitely possible by actively participating through the entire chain of value. Insurance can bring efficiencies leveraging the experience in implementing massive projects, relying on a wide, uh, wide range of skills and resources, uh, leveraging the new technologies, giving budget visibility to the government by transferring the risk and associated volatility at fixed cost. I would like to share, and I'm happy to share with you, the different experience that, um, that, that acts as a private insurer um, has and uh, in uh, supporting um, public, uh, public health systems in mature but only in emerging countries. We, we, we are heavily involved in trying to find solutions according taking into account the local specifics, but this closely, of course, with the, um, with the, with the governments. We also support private, totally private initiatives aiming to protect the most vulnerable, including women. But once again, uh, and I will invite you just after the pitch the, uh, to, to see uh, the witness of, um, of one of my colleagues uh, taking care of the implementation of dedicated to women program. Um, but once again, I would like to outline the fact that uh, if we do not have the strong willingness and support from the governments, all these private initiatives can be only uh, sporadic and they will not be as powerful as they could be if uh, private and public sector join forces together. So I would just invite you to look at the uh, testimony of my colleagues in Egypt. Hi, this is Hadil. I lead the Emerging Customers line of business at AXA Egypt. At a Hi, this is Hadil. I lead the Emerging Customers line of business at AXA Egypt. At AXA, we care about reaching out to low-income segments across the globe and in particular in Egypt. To that end, we are working here in Egypt with one of the leading microfinance institutions, Lead Foundation, to offer a cash benefit to its customer base, out of which 85% are women. The benefit is a simple cash payout for every night that the customer spends at the hospital. This money is used by the customer later on to compensate for the loss of income or the out-of-pocket expenses that they bear because of being hospitalized. I'd now like to welcome Jacqueline Karachi, the business manager for Biomeria. She focuses on the regional, commercial and strategic objectives of Biomeria. She will be speaking on the value of diagnostics to delivering care, a link to UHC. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Koshal, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jacqueline Karachi, as you've heard, and I'm the regional manager for um, our affiliates uh, in Kenya and part of the leadership team that looks into our solutions and how we can bring it closer to home. Before I start, I would just like to give a light moment and say how totally chuffed I am to be sitting next to Dr. Kihara. And for me, it is not a contradiction that we're having this conversation when we're talking about universal healthcare. And I think it's a conversation that I had with uh, Dr. Kitahi um, of AMREF some time back where he said, when you think about universal healthcare, you, you need to think about equity in health and quality in health. And the only barrier to the quality part, as far as I'm concerned, is what are we doing as private sector 
you know, to, um, to think around the challenges of market access, okay? And then how are we paying for it? Which is why I'm very happy that we had the keynote address from Dr. Camuño because now it is mandated by law that every Kenyan will be contributing to this fund and we will find a way to make sure that the quality diagnostics is available to everybody. Next slide, please. Um, when we think about clinical uh, laboratory testing, um, it is really the cornerstone of healthcare delivery. Um, in all, you know, healthcare systems, but particularly in Kenya, and depending in which, you know, um, level of healthcare facility you'll go to, chances are you'll have a quick check and then everybody sends you to the lab. And the lab has always been that, you know, mundane, dark place, you know, at the back where you kind of sit on the side and wait for somebody to give you a, you know, yeah, yeah, some kind of results that you have no idea about, that you hand over to the doctor, and it's with that information that he, you know, he or she decides how to, um, you know, on top of their own clinical diagnosis, how they will manage you, okay? What happened with COVID is that everybody understood, really, the value of diagnostics. And this is something that we're going to take and run with. It would be a shame if at the end of this pandemic, we have not built robust public health systems focused on diagnostics, if we have not leveraged the power of private sector partnerships, you know, to deliver diagnostics. I would like to see more lab chains in, in you know, uh, delivering these solutions, more hospital chains, you know, coming in to work, more insurance providers, you know, offering solutions. And so, we feel very strongly as Biomirio about what the role of diagnostics is and we, and we really do a lot you know, in that space. Uh, for primary health care, it's defined as essential care and there are very many gaps between how to diagnose disease and how to treat for it, but there are many, many things that, you know, by getting the right test at the right time that you can manage and manage correctly. Next slide, please. Actually, we'll skip this one too. Next slide. So, in terms of private sector and what we are doing, for example, at Bermerio, these are some of the things that I thought top of mind that, you know, we can be thinking about in terms of how can we support government and how can we support all the other stakeholders who are doing so much in the space of healthcare. In laboratory infrastructure, you know, um, that is something that we do and do quite well at Bermerio, working with, um, you know, many partners who are in this space. It's something that we are experts at. Laboratory solutions, that goes without saying, supply chain management, lab management skills. In this point, we're also, you know, talking a lot, even with government here, around data analytics. What do you do with that result? We had a conversation earlier today where, you know, we're finding, you know, treatments happening at, at local levels. And then you're not able to connect to the next level in terms of how do you improve on that level of care and connected health uh, needs to be top of mind and I think Kenya and Africa is best place to really leapfrog um, in, in that space and do it quite well. The other thing that I'd like to mention on is around education. So we focus on pathology and laboratory medicine, but I think generally, um, and I had a very interesting conversation today with a gentleman who's working for a German entity, and I think he's somewhere in this room at the corner there, and they have a platform you know, that is offering uh, you know, medical and nursing curriculum, uh, robust um, you know, world-class uh, solutions that is accessible to everybody. You know, and it is by using and leveraging that as well as the experts that we have on the continent, like Dr. Kehara, um, you know, to move along the conversation and to remember that with universal healthcare and diagnostics, quality and equity have to go hand in hand. And now that we are at the beginning of building this universal healthcare mandate, we have to make sure that we get that right at the beginning. You know, because, um, you know, there's nothing as bad as, you know, moving into a house only for it to, to fall down on you because your foundations are not strong enough. And so I thank you for your time and for your interest. Thank you, Jacqueline, for painting another picture of how lab diagnostics or strong lab diagnostics is so important for UHC. Thank you. So I'd now like to welcome Bertie Kraywagen, I hope I said that properly, <laughs> the Business Development Manager for Africa for Lumira DX. Lumira DX offers a unique integration of advanced point of care testing, digital connectivity, and diagnostics led care solutions for long term conditions. He will be speaking on the place of diagnostics for actual access to primary care. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, honorable guests, um, it's a privilege to present on behalf of my team for Lemira DX in Africa. And uh, as a diagnostic company, I think the overarching philosophy of Lemira DX, uh, especially if it relates to Africa, uh, has been to support the local healthcare partners, um, to incorporate the potential of our diagnostic platform into a high impact, low cost, disruptive, Diagnostic, uh, um, uh, disruptive diagnostic treatment models as part of the establishment of a primary care model for Africa. We work closely with the governments and the private market stakeholders to help design and implement effective and sustainable models for healthcare reform in order to achieve the universal health care. Going back to this morning and quote Her Excellency Ms. Uh, Margaret Kenyatta on universal health care. And it brings me to that point where we as a diagnostic company can take technology to the patient. And that brings me to the point of primary health care. Now what is primary health care in a sense? You can ask yourself a lot of questions onto that. Does it cover communicable and non-communicable diseases? Is it afford affordable testing allowing countries to adopt at large scale? And is it really closer to the patient where you want to go? The main thing here is we want to have earlier diagnosis and put these people on treatment or to at least have them in the cascade. The economic benefit to this is not just for, for the country but for the patient as well. There's fewer visits to the clinics. Now, as we obtain results out of that, what about the data? And that's where connectivity plays an important role to assimilate data to create an electronic health record for that patient. More so, the aggregated data can support the understanding of a disease progress, of a hotspot, or anything in that matter. Now, how about if you think you can have a device like this at the primary healthcare settings, empowering the healthcare workers, the nurses, the lay counselors to support, in that respect, talking about our women, to giving them tests and decisions and treatment immediately. We are fortunate with the support from the Africa Union, the Africa CDC, with implementation partners like CHAI that supported us through the African Medical Supply Platform, the donation by the support of the Gates Foundation, Rockefeller, MasterCard, has supported us to implement more than 5,000 instruments in 2021 into Africa. With the support of a pandemic focusing on the SARS-CoV-2 antigen, we delivered close to 2 million tests through this donation into Africa. But beyond COVID, what is lying beyond COVID? We're still facing a lot of other diseases. The benefit here is it's a multi-analyte platform that can test so much more in the hands of our healthcare workers to looking at the so-called non-communicable diseases and other diseases that we are facing. And for that matter, we as part of the healthcare chain always feel humbled to be part of this environment of you guys speaking about a lot of other things where the diagnostic test is important. From the laboratory testing like Bimeria, we also fit in there to support our healthcare professionals from a diagnostic point of care world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bertie. It's exciting to see how technology is improving diagnostics on the continent. I'd now like to welcome the final speaker on today's panel, Dr. Muthoni Tunjira, country manager of Philips East Africa. She manages sales and commercial partnerships with customers in East Africa, but is also a member of the Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists and Critical Care Society of Kenya. She will provide a primary healthcare perspective and will speak on digital solutions for obstructive monitoring, increasing access for mothers.
Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to having us um, on this platform. Um, at Philips, we have been in the business of improving lives for the last 130 years, and it has been our commitment to provide access to care for mothers and, and children. Um, and with this particular um, discussion, one of the key things that we want to emphasize on, and, and I'm really glad that Dr. Camunio mentioned it, is about digitization. And what we're looking at is digi uh, a digitization of healthcare from the primary healthcare level, which is an area that has been lagging behind over the years. And uh, we're talking about providing access to care from uh, a patient perspective, working with community health workers, and working with midwives at the primary care facilities. Um, the, this particular solution that I want to speak on um, is obstetrics monitoring, and this is where and when it matters, yes. Um, the solution in itself is called uh, mobile obstetrics monitoring, and it's one of the solutions developed by Philips, and with, with test cases done in several markets, uh, including Latin America, Africa, and, um, and Asia as well. Um, for the obstetrics um, solution bundle, um, what we are trying to emphasize here and um, the challenges that we're trying to mitigate is one, we have lack of real-time uh, pregnancy monitoring uh, and, and, uh, and one of the areas that we see, uh, Dr. Sari, you'll agree with me, is, is a risk, uh, early identification of uh, high-risk pregnancies and also risk uh, stratification. So this particular solution has actually an inbuilt algorithm that is able to help the healthcare worker, the mother, um, and, and the community health worker identify the, uh, the risks early enough. And in cases where referral is required, then the healthcare worker will be able to identify the risk and refer the patient to a higher level facility as and when needed. Uh, so that's one of the challenges that we're trying to mitigate and provide solutions for. The second bit, um, and, and, and this I'm really passionate about, is you find that our mothers nowadays are very digital mums, right? Everybody, um, I'm sure everyone in this room has a smartphone, right? And if you go to even the rural setting, uh, we have almost 60% use of smartphones with mothers at that end. So this particular solution also provides you with a... a, a a particular module that the patient is able to um, note one, the, the, the fetal kicks or fetal movement. Um, they're able to have a record of the previous antenatal profile so that when they present themselves at the uh, antenatal facility, they're able to provide data to the healthcare worker who's the first point of contact. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the second bit. Then on improved access, um, the frontline workers are able also to gather data uh, either from the patient, when the patient is at home, uh, and provide guidance at that level. If a mother detects that she's having reduced fetal movement, at that point, the same real-time data is communicated to either the community health worker who also has access to the patient information, or the community health, uh, sorry, the, the healthcare worker at the facility. And that way, this is identified as a risk factor and the mother is alerted to present herself at a healthcare facility. Um, the third bit is um, efficient workflows. So we see a lot of mothers presenting themselves at um, a primary care level facility, but you might find that you have high-risk mothers who are not able to, be, to get definitive treatment at that level. So the, this particular solution is also able to um, provide um, um, a, a portal that you can have access to the Lumify ultrasound. And the beauty about the Lumify ultrasound, and I love speaking about this because one of the challenges we have within our health systems is um, the human resource for health. So what we've done with this particular solution and with the Lumify is that we train the, mi the midwives to actually perform the obstetric ultrasound. And with this particular solution, the midwife actually has remote access to a, um, a specialist who's in a different location and they can together do the ultrasound. And the specialist is able to guide the healthcare worker who's at the front line, whether it's a community health worker or the midwife, who's performing the ultrasound on the risks to identify for this particular mother. And if they identify a risk factor like placenta brachio or you know, placenta previa, then they're able to refer the patient to the next level of care and get, the patient actually gets immediate care. So it's, it's a fantastic solution when it comes to risk identification and risk stratification and also immediate um, referral of mothers to higher levels of care with early interve intervention. Um, next, please. 
Um, I will not speak too much about this because this is just um, showing the development of our mom vision. What we had in mind and what we envisioned is to actually track the first 1,000 uh, days of life. Yeah? And we're talking about uh, conception um, uh, during the, the antenatal period, intrapartum and, and postpartum tracking up to the point where the child is two years old. Um, in this, of course, the antenatal profiling, um, you're able to, to have records of the mother in terms of the labs that have been done. You're able then to even um, have your antenatal examination, noting the vital signs from the first visit to the number of visits that the mother will have. So it's tracked down, the data is within the, the application. If an ultrasound is performed, the actual image of the ultrasounds are stored within the patient. Uh, uh, profile. So it's a fantastic way of keeping track. On the mother's side, then they're able to also keep a track of their uh, kick counter. And even when we're monitoring um, uh, early danger signs like uh, preeclampsia, the mother is also able to keep track of her weight in case there are any changes in her weight. And this way we have uh, proper risk stratifications of the mother who might be at risk later on in the pregnancy. Next, please. So this slide just shows some of the case studies we've done. I, I will not dwell too much on it, but um, we have seen very fantastic results in some of the areas that this uh, mom solution has been implemented, with 48% reduction in the number of anemic cases between uh, the second and the third trimester. We've also seen um, in this particular case study, we actually had zero maternal deaths amongst the 5,170 pregnant mothers who were being monitored using this mom solution. Um, and we also are able to have a three-time or uh, three-fold improvement in early detection of high-risk pregnancies. Of course, in our setup, the, the data might be different. We might be in a different um, ecosystem. And what we're doing is currently carrying out a study in Kilifi, um, together with uh, uh, Aga Khan University Hospital under the leadership of Prof. Malin. And we've been doing this for the last two and a half years and are hoping, as we're in the tail end of the case study, we'll be able to present uh, results that are more relatable to our, our context. Um, next, please. So this essentially presents uh, what we are looking at in terms of a mom and an ultrasound use case. So you have your midwife uh, being the centerpiece who, of course, is a frontline uh, healthcare worker who will be able to monitor the pregnancy for the mom. Of course, we know in our setup, the primary uh, healthcare giver at a, uh, a, a level one to level three facility is a midwife. Yeah? The specialists will be found in the higher level facilities. But because of that uh, uh, um, setup and the scenario we're looking at in terms of human resources for health, we provided for remote diagnostics via the obstetrician who will can rem remotely uh, view the images of the obstetric ultrasounds that are conducted by the uh, midwife. And if there are any cases of concern, then he's able to alert the midwife. Yeah? Um, the mom, of course, is also able to monitor her pregnancy. Um, and in cases where we feel that there is need for referral, then the portal actually has um, access to the referral facility where they can access the data presented by the midwife on, 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 the, on the primary uh, care end. Next, please. Oh, that's the, the last one, all right. Um, so um, one of the areas I wanted to emphasize on is as Philips, we're looking at access to care from different, uh, from a multifaceted approach. We're not looking at it primarily only from the caregiver's perspective, but we're also looking at it from the patient's end. Yeah. So a mother is more enlightened. They are more empowered to monitor their pregnancy. They have access to the care that they would have at a higher level facility. And we're hoping through this solution, we'll be able to, to provide for moms uh, uh, safe deliveries and a, and a very safe uh, pregnancy journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Muthoni. Um, in the interest of time, I'm now going to shift to the quick fire parting shots from all the panelists. So a one minute summary from each panelist on how we think um, the health and well-being for women in Africa can be improved via universal health coverage and specifically via partnerships with the private sector. We'll start with um, Dr. Muthoni, please. Uh, thank you. My parting shot will be, uh, we need to provide access to care and access to quality and affordable care. And let's move away from our traditional way of thinking. Let's move more towards digitizing healthcare. And that way we provide simpler solutions, um, quality uh, access to um, higher levels of care, 
with the right um, special um, specialist yeah, through remote access. And, and that way we'll be able to move away from the traditional way of thinking that I have to sit across a patient, but embrace more of the telehealth approach of delivering healthcare. Thank you. And Dr. Kihara? I won't repeat what she's saying, but I want to speak to the health personnel. Because bottom line, you must have a health personnel and you have to have the diagnostics to be able to give quality care. And I specifically want to point my eyes to Dr. Jacqueline. Decentralized health provision, private sector, please invest in decentralizing doctors for the simple reason, mentorship, apprenticeship, and exchange programs will improve quality. So my parting shot is uh, just a reflection on uh, the speech that was made this morning by our permanent secretary for health. She spent 80% of the conversation on what we have done as a country moving forward, moving the health agenda forward, and you know, 20% on the challenges. And it's the same perspective that I see, you know, working in Kenya and looking at, you know, Africa in terms of the solutions that we have at Bio Miriam. We have come so far, you know, and so many things that are happening and happening every day, you know, in terms of interventions. And for me, the challenges that we face, the solutions are right here. They have been discussed by all the specialists, they have been discussed by the, you know, providers in this room. So the only thing left to do is how do we act? How do we act in a concerted manner so that, you know, when Africa Health, you know, Business Summit, you know, holds a session with the Ministry of Health and they say, look, we're going to focus on laboratory diagnostics. Can you tell us what your challenges are? And you bring stakeholders to the table and we give you or we just tell you what we are doing because we are doing all those things and how do we work with government? Same thing around cancer, same thing around, you know, you know reproductive health, etc. So let's connect the dots and make a difference. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. I think you will agree with me that it's the best um, or the most beautiful goals that I share with states this afternoon. Um, that's not my only party slot. I just want to thank um, AHB for arranging this conference and, and being part of this uh, event. I think hereby in, in engaging with a lot of our partners and people that we can share and, and discuss the opportunity going forward and helping us to achieve by reaching the patient and then make use of the technology that is coming forward, like our technology and many others that is present here today, to support the patient out there. And believe it or not, we are also patients. And uh, to just give you an example of Kenya as my first, or our first NGO that actually invested in our platform and employed it was in Kenya. And one of our um, delegates here, um, uh, from Ilara Health is actually sitting in the audience and I want to congratulate her and thank her as the first pro uh, private partnership that, that came in and support our product and then take it to the market. So thank you very much to that. And I'm looking forward to have more of these events uh, in the near future because that way we can engage, plan and let's implement. Thank you. Thank you. And Elena. I will be brief. I'm, I'm happy and impressed to see that there, are, well, there are a lot uh, that has been done and there are clearly um, um, la willingness to, to solve the challenges that we're all witnessing from the public side and the, from the private. And clearly interests are aligned and now, as you mentioned, the dots has to be, have to be connected. And uh, instead of um, initiating uh, sporadic initiatives, so let's connect the dots and clearly there is a willingness and there is no reason that um, UHC cannot be reached. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Right, so to wrap up the session, I'd like to say that we all already know that women's health must be a shared agenda. It's really important that the private sector form linkages not only with each other but also the public sector to strengthen progress towards UHC. And it's been really, really fantastic to learn about what different private sector players are already doing on the continent. So we can only go upwards from here. Thank you. Thank you to the panel as well. Thanks.